The two young Crotchets laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favor when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice at a milliner's, then told them what kind of work she had to do and how many hours she worked at a stretch, and how she meant to lie in bed tomorrow morning for a good long rest. Tomorrow being a holiday, she passed at home. Also, how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, at which Peter pulled up his collar so high that you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time the chestnuts and the jug went round, and by and by they had a song about a lost child traveling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothing were scanty, and Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch at parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. It was a great surprise to Scrooge as the scenes vanished to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's, and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room, with the spirit standing smiling by his side and looking at that same nephew. It is fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things that while there is infection in disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. When Scrooge's nephew laughed, Scrooge's niece by marriage laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends, being not a bit behind, laughed just as lustily. He said that Christmas was a humbug, as I live, cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it, too. More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece, indignantly. Bless those women, they never do anything by halves, they are always in earnest. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, as no doubt it was, all kinds of good little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed, and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw in any little creature's head. Altogether, she was what you would have called provoking, but satisfactory, too. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself. Here he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He don't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everybody else said the same, and they must be allowed to have been com competent judges because they had just had dinner, and with the dessert upon the table now were clustered round the fire by lamplight. Well, I am very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I have any great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper clearly had his eye on Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast who had no right to express an opinion on the subject, whereas Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. After tea, they had some music for they were a musical family and knew what they were about. When they sung a glee or catch, I can assure you, especially Topper who could growl away in the bass like a good one and never swell the large veins in his forehead or get red in the face over it. But they didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while they played at forfeits, for it is good to be children sometimes and never better than at Christmas when its mighty founder was a child himself. There was first a game at Blind Men's Bluff, 
and I no more believe Topper was really blinded than I believe he had eyes in his boots. Because the way in which he went after that plump sister in the lace tucker was an outrage in the credulity of human nature. Knocking down the fire irons, tumbling over the chairs, bumping up against the piano, smothering himself among the curtains whenever, wherever she went, there he was. He was always where the plump sister was. He would catch he would catch no one else. He, if you had fallen up against him, as some of them did, and stood there, he would have made a feint of endeavoring to seize you, which would have been a reply to affront to your understanding, and would instantly have sidled off in the direction of the plumb sister. Here is a new game, said Scrooge. One half hour spirit, only one. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something and the rest might find out what. He only answering to their questions, yes or no, as the case was. The fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes, and lived in London and walked about the streets, and wasn't made uh, a show-off and wasn't led by anybody and didn't live in a menagerie and was never killed in a market was not a horse an ass a cow a bull a tiger a dog a pig a cat or a bear at every new question put to him this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter and was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp at last the plump sister cried out I have found it. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it? cried Fred. It's your uncle, Scrooge. Which it certainly was. Admiration was the sentiment, though some objected that the reply to is it a bear ought to have been yes. Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of the heart that he would have drank to the unconscious company in an audible speech. But the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last word spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful on foreign lands, and they were close at home. By struggling men, and they were patient at their greater hope by poverty, and it was rich. In an almshouse, hospital, or jail, in misery's every refuge, where vain men in his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, he left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. Suddenly, as they stood together in an open place, the bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost and saw it no more. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. Stave 4. The Last of the Spirits The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached, and when it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the air through which the spirit moved it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible, save one outstretched hand. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter I have ever seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and I, I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear you company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on, lead on. The night is waning fast and is precious time to me. I know. Lead on, spirit. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up about them. But there they were in the heart of it, on change amongst the merchants. The spirits stopped beside one little knot of businessmen, 
Observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said a great fat man with a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. Why, what was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows, said the first with a yawn. What has he done with his money? asked a red-faced gentleman. I haven't heard, said the man with the large chin. Company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me. That's all I know. Bye-bye. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance to conversation, apparently so trivial, but feeling assured that it must have some hidden purpose. He set himself to consider what it was likely to be. He could scarcely be supposed to have any bearing on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was past, and the ghost province was the future. He looked about it in that very place for his own image now, but another man stood in his accustomed corner, and though the clock pointed to his usual time of day for being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes that poured in through the porch. It gave him little surprise, however, for, for he had been revolving in his mind a change of life, and he thought and hoped he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this. They left the busy scene and went into the obscure part of the town, to a low shop where iron, old rags, bottles, bones, and greasy offal were bought. A gray-haired rascal of great age sat there smoking a pipe. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of the man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk onto the shop. But she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly laden, came in too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black. After a short period of blank astonishment, in which the old man with the pipe had joined them, they all three burst out into laughter. Let the chairwoman alone to be the first, cried she who had entered first. Let the laundress alone to be the second, and let the undertaker's man alone to be the third. Look here, old Joe, here's a chance if we haven't all three met here without meaning it. You couldn't have met in a better place. You were made free of it long ago, you know, and the other two strangers. What have you got to sell? What have you got for me? Half a minute, patience, Joe, and you shall see. What odds, then? What odds, Mrs. Dilber? said the woman. Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. Mrs. Dilber, whose manner was remarkable for general propitiation, said, No, indeed, ma'am. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, a wicked old screw, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying gasping out his last there alone by himself. It's the truest word that ever was spoken. It's a judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier judgment, and it should have been, but you may depend upon it. If I could have laid my hands on anything else, open that bundle, Joe, and let me know the value. Speak out plainly. I am not afraid to be the first, nor afraid of them to see it. Joe went down on his knees for the greater convenience of opening the bundle, and dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff. What do you call this, bed curtains? Ah, bed curtains, don't drop that oil upon the blankets now. His blankets? Whose else do you think he isn't likely to take cold without him, I dare say? Ha! You may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole. It's the best he had, and a fine one, too. They'd have wasted it by dressing him up in it if he hadn't been for me. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. Spirit, I see this case of an unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Merciful heaven, what is this? The scene changed, and now he almost touched a bare, uncurtained bed. A pale light, rising in the outer air, fell straight upon the bed, and on it, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of the plundered unknown man. 
Spirit, let me see some tenderness connected with the death. Spirit, will you forever present to me? The ghost conducted him to poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had been in before, and found the mother and the children seated around the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner and sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in needlework, but surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Where had Scrooge heard those words before he had not dreamed them? The boy must have read them out as he and his spirit crossed the threshold. Why did he not go on? The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. The color hurts my eyes, she said. The color? Ah, poor tiny Tim. They're better now again, and it makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home. For the world, it must be near his time now. Past it, rather, Peter answered, shutting up the book, but I think he has walked a little slower than he used to these last few evenings. I have known him walk with I have known him walk with tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed, and so have I cried Peter often, and so have I exclaimed another, so had they all, but he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so that it was no trouble, no trouble, and there is your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him, and little Bob and his comforter he had need of it, poor fellow, came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob, and they were all tried who should help him to it most. Then the young Cratchits got upon his knees and laid each child a little cheek against his face, as if they said, Don't mind it, father, don't be grieved. Bob was a very cheerful man with them and spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and speed of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls. They would be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday, you went today then, Robert? Yes, my dear. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child, my little child. He broke down all at once. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been farther apart, perhaps, than they were. Spectre, said Scrooge, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what man that was with the covered face whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him to a dismal, wretched, ruinous churchyard. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Before I draw near to the stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the things of the shadows of the, what will be, or are they shadows of the things that may be only? Still, the ghost pointed to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends, and they must lead, but if the courses be departed, the, the ends will change. Say it thus with what you show me now. The spirit was immovable and as silent as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger read upon the stone of the ne neglected grave his own name. Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I that man who lay upon the bed? No, spirit, no. Hear me, I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been, but for this intercourse, why show me this if I am past all hope? Assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. For the first time, the kind hand faltered. I will honor Christmas in my heart and will keep it all year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they have taught me. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. Holding up his hands in one last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. 
best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. He was checked in his transports by the churches ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head, no fog, no mist, no night, clear, bright, stirring, golden day. What's today? cried Scrooge, calling downward to a boy in Sunday clothes who perhaps had loitered in to look about him. Eh? What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why Christmas Day? It's Christmas Day. I haven't missed it. Hello, my fine young fellow. Hello. Do you know the polterers in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope I did. An intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not, not the little prize turkey, the big one. What? The one as big as me? What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now. Is it? Go and buy it. Walker, exclaimed the boy. No, no, I am in earnest. Go and buy it and tell him to bring it here and I may give them the direction where to take it. Come back with me and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you a half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's. He shan't know who sends it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Joe Miller never made such a joke as sending it to Bob's will be. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did, somehow, and went down to stairs to open the street door, ready for the coming of the poulterer's man. It was a turkey. He never could have stood upon its legs, that bird. He would have snapped them short off in a minute like sticks of sealing wax. Scrooge dressed himself in all his best, and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present. And walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded every one with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant, in a word, that three or four good-humored fellows said, Good morning, sir, a Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said often afterwards that of all the blithe sounds he had ever heard, those were the blithest in his ears. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock. But he made a dash and did it. Is your master at home, my dear? said Scrooge to the girl. Nice girl, very. Yes, sir. Where is he, my love? He's in the dining room, sir, with his mistress. He knows me, said Scrooge, with his hand already on the dining room lock. I'll go in here, my dear. Fred! Why, bless my soul, cried Fred. Who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I have come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in. It is a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. His niece looked just the same. So did Topper when he came. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, and wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. That was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. The, the clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. Bob was full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. Bob's hat was off before he opened the door. His comforter, too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello! growled Scrooge, his accustomed voice as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I am very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend, I am not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, Scrooge continued, leaping from his stool and giving Bob such a dig in the waistcoat that he staggered back into the tank again. And therefore, I am about to raise your salary. Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. 
A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge, with an earnestness that could not be mistaken, as he clapped him on the back. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have ever given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family, and we'll discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking Bishop Bob. Make up the fires, buy a second coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word, he did it all, and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as a good friend, a good master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, borough, in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but his own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived in that respect upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well. If any man alive possessed the knowledge, may that be truly said of all of us and any of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us all, everyone. The End <laughs>